Well everyone, it's been a while since we've discussed female issues here on Cinema Nippon, whether in terms of women behind the camera or in front of it. And given how that always gets some <laughs> interesting reactions, let's take a look back at a film series we covered a few years back. Today, we're going to the 1970s to discuss one of Japan's best kept secrets in terms of strange franchises with Stray Cat Rock a sprawling five-film epic released in less than 12 months. Mind you, none of these films are directed by women, but they could be argued to be empowering to a female audience, so we figured it was worth a shot to look at them. The series is composed of five films, all released in rapid succession between May 1970 and January 1971. The first, third, and fourth were directed by Yasuharu Hasebe, who you might recognize for his late 60s Yakuza work with Nikatsu, or for directing the final film in the Female Prisoner Scorpion series. The second and fifth films were directed by Toshia Fujita, who also directed the leading lady of the series, Meiko Kaji, with both of the cult classic Lady Snowblood films in the years following the Stray Cat Rock series. Yasuharu Hasebe began his career at Nikatsu as an assistant director, working under other big directors at the studio, among them Seijun Suzuki. Where Meiko Kaji left Nikatsu following their move to Pink Film, Hasebe stayed with the studio for another decade, producing some of Nikatsu's ever-evolving films in the genre, his favorite being Violent Pink, with such charming titles as Rape, Assault, Jack the Ripper, and Attacked. Yeah, charming. Later in the 70s, Hasebe finally bit the bullet and left Nikatsu, producing a small number of films for Toei throughout the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, before passing away in 2009 of pneumonia at the age of 77. Stray Cat Rock, in spite of this bizarre career, remains one of Hasebe's accidental high points. Accidental because he admitted in an interview prior to his death that he didn't expect the first film to succeed, nor for it to even become a series. The series is also bizarre for him when you consider the feminist undertones of the films and compare them with his later works. But more on this later. The series' other director, Toshia Fujita, began his career with making delinquent youth films, though he is most well remembered for the aforementioned Lady Snowblood films, also starring Meiko Kaji. Fujita was born in Japanese occupied Korea in 1932. Like Hasebe, he began his film career with Nikatsu, though he filmed a number of different roles before finally becoming a director in his mid 40s. He remained with Nikatsu for a time, producing pink films, while injecting his own personal youth film slant into these projects. This is important to note, as his two entries into this series were his fourth and sixth films, respectively, making him a perfect fit for the franchise given the subject matter and the ages of the characters. It can be surmised, then, that exploitation was the perfect genre for both of these directors. Just as in the US and other similar countries, the exploitation genre was at its height in the 1970s. Exploitation can be defined as something that, well, exploits something that's popular or controversial to gain notoriety. The vast majority of these films are B-movies, meaning that little money is budgeted towards them. Simply put, most exploitation movies aren't going to be huge blockbuster blowouts, though it's not entirely unheard of. And while the genre might have been exceedingly popular in the 70s, riding the wave of social upheaval of the late 60s, and thanks to the relatively cheap cameras of the era, it did exist as far back as the beginning of film. Today's films, Stray Cat Rock, were released at the peak of exploitation's popularity and reach. With that background out of the way, let's jump into the films themselves. Afterward, we'll explore more in depth what the films themselves and the messages and themes within meant about Japan and the world as a whole at the time in which they were released. The entire series is available in the West both on DVD and Blu-ray by Arrow Video, who we would like to thank for providing our review copy of this series. The films are also available for streaming on Amazon as of this writing. We recommend checking out the films, then coming back to examine them with us. Without further delays, Let's jump right in. The first film, Alley Cat Rock Delinquent Girl Boss, which was written by Hideichi Nagahara, who would later go on to pen the screenplay for Godzilla 85, centers around a drifter, Akko, played by Akiko Wada, an actress who's primarily a singer and, more recently, a voice actor. Akko rolls into town and comes across a gang of young women, with whom she falls in, and who are warring with a rival biker gang with connections to the local Yakuza outfit. 
Akko seems to naturally become the leader of the group, with Meiko Kaji playing second fiddle as Mei, one of the more prominent members. The whole thing is actually rather slow burning, in spite of being only 80 minutes in length. There are a number of action scenes in which the girls do battle with the rival gang, but none of them are heavily stylized, with most of the actual violence happening off screen. This could be in part due to the low budget of the project or the rapid pace with which it was completed, but either way it leads to a sense of hokiness to the whole film. What's notable about this, whether intentional or not, is that the violence is never gender exclusive, with brutality happening to and being committed by both the men and women. Essentially, despite the film being written, directed, and filmed by men, it never feels like it's focusing on the sexiness of the women, but rather the power that they possess, putting them on equal footing with the men that they're battling. That's not even mentioning the trippy, obviously just barely post-60s rock sequences. There's a club where the gang hangs out and later in the film holes up to protect themselves. Pretty much every time we come to this club, there's a psychedelic scene involving rock music, flashing lights, woozy colors, and swooping cameras. The main plot of the film involving the Yakuza is kicked off when Michio, the friend of a champion boxer named Kelly, asks Kelly to throw a match so that the Yakuza organization can make a ton of money, which he intends to do, only to go back on it at the last minute. This leads the Yakuza and their underlings, the biker gang, to hunt down Michio and the gang of girls, who try to save him due to their friendship with Kelly, which ignites something of a downward spiral. In the end, everyone is drawn into the fray, with a number of bloody deaths, and Akko riding off into the proverbial sunset, leaving the gang to handle themselves. The second film, Stray Cat Rock Wild Jumbo, saw the return of Hideichi Nagahara as screenwriter and Meiko Kaji, this time replacing Akiko Wada in the starring female role. Yasuharu Hasebe, director of the previous film, explained in an interview included on Arrow's release of the series that the first film came to fruition as a vehicle for Akiko Wada, rather than simply casting her in the role of the eponymous delinquent girl boss. However, given that she was a singer first and an actor second, her tight schedule meant that the other main characters needed to occupy a good portion of the film's runtime and shooting schedule. This explains Meiko Kaji, who played a secondary character in the previous film, assuming the leading role here. And while Wada has a tiny cameo at the start of the second film, one of the characters later watches Kelly's boxing match on TV, and there's at least one instance of a reused song in the soundtrack, the film otherwise has virtually no connection to the first. Essentially, we're given indications that the films are occurring in the same universe, but neither has any direct impact on the other. But wait, if Meiko Kaji has returned here, then how does that exactly work? Well, Wild Jumbo is another delinquent youth film, which makes a whole lot of sense given the director's past in the genre. Completely gone is the biker gang angle, with only small callbacks to the first, like the inclusion of a dune buggy that moves up and down some stairs, as does the one used in the climax of Delinquent Female Boss. Thus, we're not following any of the characters from the original, instead watching the story of the Pelican Gang, among whose membership is Siko, Meiko Kaji's character in this film. The gang are a group of deviants who steal what they want and do what they want, maintaining a rivalry with a gang of rich kids that they more or less write off as posers. For the first half of the film, we follow the Pelican gang around as they do their various dirty deeds. They get into fights, harass people at a beach, get their hideout trashed, and one of them discovers a cache of buried guns from the 1910s. The main plot of the film, which kicks in around the halfway mark, revolves around Taki, one of the Pelican Gang's guys, falling in with the mistress of a religious group's leader. She helps the gang hatch a plan to steal a hefty sum from the religious group. They collectively train for the operation, plan it out meticulously, then attempt to execute it. So effectively, Wild Jumbo is a delinquent film that turns into a heist film, which ends about as well as you might imagine. While the first two films were pretty different from one another in terms of tone and plot, the third film, Sex Hunter, was a departure for the series. This is because the others had had the same screenwriter, while here, Takashi Fuji took up the position. 
At the time, at the time of release, this might have seemed odd, but in retrospect, we know that Takashi Fuji was a pseudonym, and that Sex Hunter was actually written by Yasuhara Hasebe himself. You'll recall Hasebe was the first film's director, who here took to penning the screenplay while also in the director's chair. In an interview with Hasebe later in life, he commented that Sex Hunter wasn't intended originally to be a part of the Stray Cat Rock series, and that these films weren't even intended to be a series in the first place. The first film had been a surprise hit, which might explain the different crew on the second film. Sex Hunter, meanwhile, is a different story yet again. The film was originally titled Manhunt, and was intended to be a part of the Frontline of the Night series, rather than Stray Cat Rock. Frontline of the Night was a short-lived series by Nikatsu, with only two titles released, one in 1969 and one in 1971, concerning youth violence, but with more of a sexual tinge than the previous two Stray Cat Rock entries. This will explain some of the differences between this film and the others as we go forward. And where the first two films were fairly raucous youth rebellion films, Sex Hunter takes head-on the idea of bona fide social commentary. The main plot of the film revolves around Mako, here called Mako, and her gang of women who have something of a love-hate relationship with a gang of men known as the Eagles. When the Eagles discover that one of Mako's crew is in love with a man who is half Japanese, here played by the same actor who portrayed Kelly, the boxer, in Delinquent Female Boss, let's just say they don't take too kindly to this. So the eagles go on a rampage, trying to throw all non-ethnically Japanese people out of their turf, beginning with biracial people, then moving up to the bar where foreigners hang out. Toward the climax of the film, Baron, the leader of the eagles, becomes so upset by Mako and company's sympathies toward these non-Japanese individuals that he sells them to a man who then sets up a party for foreigners to sexually take advantage of the gang. Baron, though possessive of Mako, remember we said they had a love-hate relationship, doesn't allow her to take part in the party, meaning that she catches wind of what's going on and is able to save the others. Then they collectively rebel against the men, leading to the true climax of the film. All throughout, another half-Japanese man, Kazuma, has been drifting about town, looking for his sister, Megumi. He says that they were separated as children, but that he knows she must be here. The eagles threaten Kazuma repeatedly, but he demands that he can stay in town until he finds her, leading to the whole thing feeling something like a western. In the end, Baron and Kazuma's standoff feels like something straight out of a Sergio Leone film. The fourth film, Machine Animal, was penned by Ryuzo Nakanishi, a new face for the franchise. We follow Meiko, here called Maya, and her gang of girls. They take time roughing up men around town, generally doing as they please. This comes to a head when they encounter a couple of men that they repeatedly refer to as rednecks. These men, as well as a foreigner who has fled his draft duty in the Vietnam War, are seeking passage via boat to Sweden, and need to unload 500 hits of acid to make the money needed for the trip. This is where Maya's gang comes in, with several of the women hijacking their car, stealing the stash, and dropping some of the acid. When Maya gets word that this has happened, she returns the drugs and offers the men a place to stay. Meanwhile, she tries to broker a deal with the local gang's male figurehead to distribute the LSD, a deal which goes south when the leader decides he would rather take advantage of the rednecks and leave them high and dry. This, as you can imagine, leads to a bloody climax not unlike the previous films in the series. The gang's leader is played by Eiji Go, who you might remember for having a small part in Youth of the Beast, and who was popular bad boy Joe Shishiro's younger brother. The fifth and final film, Beat 71, saw even more changes for the franchise. While Hasebe stepped down as director, with Toshio Fujita assuming the position once more, Hideichi Nagahara, the screenwriter for the first two films, made his triumphant return as the writer here. What's odd, though, is that in some ways Beat 71 is the largest departure from form for the series. The plot this time revolves around Meiko Kaji's character, here named Furiko, being kidnapped and held in confinement. Her boyfriend, Ryume, a member of yet another gang of miscreants, murders a man with whom Furiko is cheating on him. He then flees, and she takes the fall for it. She and her sister end up in prison, but escape within a few months, at which point Ryume's family captures her and holds her. You see, 
Ryume's father is actually the mayor of a small town. Being bored of the small town, he fled to the big city earlier in life, at which point he met up with and joined the hippie gang in which Furiko was also a member. However, after murdering the other man, he returned home and took up his position as his father's heir apparent, committing to entering politics and assuming the family's responsibilities. Furiko, thus, is a thorn in the side of the whole family, but one which is easily dispensed, given that Ryume's father has the local police in his pocket. What's more annoying, then, are the rest of the gang, who show up to find Furiko, which ultimately leads to Ryume having another change of heart, swapping sides once more, and attempting to rejoin his old gang to confront the police and his father's men. The film and the series close with a shootout in an abandoned mine which was converted into a set for shooting western films. This, ultimately, is a fitting end to the franchise. And why is that? Well, throughout the entirety of the series, we get numerous references and callbacks to westerns. And not like the movies made in the west, we mean to say the western genre itself. In the second film, one of the main characters wears a cowboy hat and poncho while munching on a cigar a la Clint Eastwood. The shout-out at the end of the third film is heavily reminiscent of the bloody, fate-driven encounters you might see at the close of a western film, not to mention the visual callbacks earlier in the film, like the framing of the bar scene where Kazuma and Baron are arguing while ordering drinks. The plot of the fourth film, a group trying to steal another's valuables and leave them marooned, while the first group is simply trying to pass through town, sounds like something straight out of a western when put on paper. Even the romanticism of the various drifter characters we follow through each iteration of the franchise is reminiscent of the western. The Thanatos, or Death Drive, like you would see in someone like Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, is present throughout almost all of the main characters in this series, making them risk their lives for most situations in which they find themselves. For a prime example of this, and of the drifter archetype, look no further than the mysterious badass that is Akko from the first film, who rides into town on her motorcycle, then is able to solve some of the town's problems before drifting on once more. The franchise effectively begins and ends with Western symbolism, as the final film ends on a literal Western film set with a shootout between corrupt local officials and a band of drifters who want nothing more than to save their own and do what's right. The cowboy and the Western drifter might be wholly American ideas, representing something like the American version of a mythical icon with their stories rising to the heights of arthurial legends. But in Japan, the ronin, a samurai without a master, has been compared to this drifter in terms of romanticism. They're both an archetype who are, in reality, long gone meaning that we can project all we want onto them in terms of tragedy and sentimentality, seeing as how they have no actual bearing in life today. Another comparison might be the Yakuza present in Ninkyo Ega, or chivalry films, which are largely period pieces, again removing them from a modern context, making it easier to project tragic undertones onto them. But with Stray Cat Rock, we actually see a number of Western themes, archetypes, and visual cues brought forward into the present day, with the contemporary equivalent of Western outlaws cast in the starring roles, rather than having the series be a period piece. The Western genre is one born out of American filmmaking and remains popular today, though perhaps not as much so as in previous generations, making it one of the oldest film genres in existence. They concern themselves, as Stray Cat Rock does, with the ideologies of a bold new frontier, set mostly in a time when the Western United States had not become proper states yet. Thus, this area becomes the perfect breeding ground for thieves, bandits, and desperados, and our favorite archetype in the series that appears again and again, the Drifter. The Western represents a time in American history when there was a great unknown in the country, before the landmass of America had been settled, as it were. While there had been multiple proper westerns produced in Japan prior to the Stray Cat Rock films, the series took inspiration from the genre while not emulating it exactly, as confirmed by Yasuharu Hasebe in an interview included in Arrow's box set release. The series seems to draw off of this tradition in western films to show that, following the withdrawal of American troops after the occupation of Japan, the country had become something like the Wild West. Sure, the whole landmass had already been discovered and settled or colonized, but for the first time in decades, the Japanese public were left to their own devices, meaning that the counterculture and hippie movements were able to thrive, bringing the good with the bad.
You might remember way back when we brought up the author Yukio Mishima, a right-wing radical, who, particularly later in life, wanted nothing more than to overthrow the Western-modeled government that had been put in place following the close of World War II, and to return Japan to world military power. We're bringing him up again in this video because the rival biker gang from the first film, by Hasebe's own admission, was based on the Shield Society, or Tate no Kai, a private militia that Mishima founded in the final years of his life. You see, Mishima was in such good standing with certain government officials, as an artistic darling, that he was able to secure permission for the SHIELD Society to train with Japan's military, the Self-Defense Force. He exploited this in late 1970 to occupy the Self-Defense Force's main base of operations, where he and select members of the SHIELD Society attempted to stage a coup d'etat by riling up the Self-Defense Force members on base at the time. This was in hopes that they could all overthrow the ruling government collectively. As you may have guessed, this didn't work out. And Mishima, along with his second-in-command, committed seppuku. Similar to Aum Shinriko, who we have discussed on several episodes now, the majority of the SHIELD Society's membership, mostly intellectuals and university students who were devout followers of Mishima's works and ideology, were wholly unaware of the plan until after it had been attempted. Thus, prior to this incident, the public may have viewed the SHIELD Society as some sort of vanity project of a megalomaniac, not inherently a real threat. If you'll recall, the release date of the first film mentioned before, this all comes together, as Mishima killed himself in November 1970, while the first film in which the SHIELD Society derivative appears was released in May 1970. Thus, this inspiration was perhaps more innocuous than retrospect would suggest, though it can help to inform us about contemporary events and sentiments. Also in terms of advancement and change, Stray Cat Rock is notable, as the majority of the franchise was released in the year before Nikatsu took to producing almost exclusively pink films, with their Roman porno series. Though, I'm sure some will argue that Roman porno were not pink films and that they were their own thing, regardless. It was the last major project that Meiko Kaji worked on with Nikatsu, before jumping ship in 1971 to join Toei, where the two major franchises we keep mentioning were produced. Nikatsu made this move to producing pink films for financial reasons. Simply put, they could produce them on incredibly small budgets, churn them out on a weekly basis, and make relatively large returns. In this way, Stray Cat Rock was something of a last hurrah for attempting to turn a profit on cheap exploitation films. Meiko Kaji had been acting for half a decade by the time she appeared in the Stray Cat Rock series, and while she wouldn't do her most well-remembered work until later in the decade with Lady Snowblood and the Female Prisoner Scorpion series, Stray Cat Rock signaled the beginning of Kaji's rise to fame. Up until 1970, the year that Stray Cat Rock was released, Kaji had racked up a solid number of roles, but the vast majority of them were under her birth name, Masako Ota. Using pseudonyms and stage names is a very common thing in the Japanese film industry, meaning that this switch from Masako Ota to Meiko Kaji signaled a huge shift in her career path. She was effectively rebranding herself, beginning with Blind Woman's Curse, a horror film that was produced by Nikatsu and which has recently been re-released by Arrow Video. These films were also produced solidly in the center of the second wave of feminism. This movement focused on equality in schooling and the workplace, as well as garnering equal pay for equal labor, at least in the United States. Mitsu Tanaka, one of the leaders of the movement in Japan, contested that the United States' involvement in feminism is what sparked the Japanese movement, though stating that it wasn't about workplace equality, but about fundamental equality, quote-unquote liberation from their sex. Given the, quote, fundamentally repressed role that women were forced to play, end quote. While the 1800s onward had seen various feminist movements come and go within Japan, a familiar story for many in the English-speaking world, it wasn't until the 1970s that the movement known as women's liberation began in the country. While most of the debate and discourse over reframing the history of women in Japan was relegated to universities, sociologists, and historians, we can see through Stray Cat Rock that they weren't the only ones affected by this change. And while the movement didn't really pick up a huge amount of steam in the public eye until following the 1975 UNO conference later in the decade, things were already heating up, if these films were any indication. 
This may seem counterintuitive when considering the films that Hasebe went on to produce later in his career, if you'll recall those charming titles. But there's a pretty strong argument for the Stray Cat Rock films having feminist undertones and characterization. The women are generally not used as plot devices and are treated as equal to men in terms of violence and respect. The female characters have ample opportunity to serve comeuppance to any men who explicitly deem them a lower for being a woman while not being too preachy or heavy-handed. Simply put, you can read a feminist narrative into the plots of the Stray Cat Rock films, but it's not at all necessary to see them this way. It's a subtext, not the main point of the movies. As you can hopefully see, there's a lot of subtext and cultural background to these five films. And while, in some ways, they might not totally hold up today, there are certainly things that were impressive about them for their time. The effects in the first film are eye-catching and pretty fantastic given the era and low budget of the project. The idea of a film series composed of a loosely connected collection of events with similar themes and ideas, while sharing actors playing different characters between projects, was something we perhaps would not see again for a little while. And in terms of studying film and Japanese culture, there's such a wealth of information about what went into the films and what surrounded their productions. This, at least for us, is the true beauty of Stray Cat Rock, what it can teach us. Hasebe, concerning the legacy of the series, was quoted as saying, quote, We vividly remember some films decades after their release. When you watch them again later, it's important to remember the impact they had on release. That's what I thought about films in general. The approach to films have changed quite a lot. End quote. And that's exactly why these films, in spite of all their flaws, are important to Japanese film history.